Good evening, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Kernersville Board of Aldermen. Today is Tuesday, April 2nd, and we're glad you could join us here this evening. We'll begin tonight with an invocation by Reverend Michael Walton from LC3, Liberty Community Christian Church. Amen. Greetings, Madam Mayor, elected officials, administrative staff, and citizens of Kernersville. Let us pray. All wise Heavenly Father, first let me say thank you on behalf of all who are gathered here today. Thank you for your many and abundant blessings. Thank you for life itself and for the measure of health we need to fulfill our callings. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. Scripture tells us that citizens ought to be able to obey the governing authorities since you have established those very authorities to promote peace and order and justice. Therefore, Heavenly Father, I pray for our mayor, for the various levels of town officials, and for this assembled council. I'm asking that you would graciously grant them wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our times, a sense of welfare and true needs of our people, a keen thirst for justice and righteousness, confidence in what is good and fitting. Then, Father, give us the ability to work together in harmony, even when there is honest disagreement. Father, I pray for the agenda set before us today. There is safety in the multitude of counsel. So grant us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that the outcome will benefit those who live and work in and around our beloved town of Kernersville. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Walton. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. So it's one of my honors as mayor to be able to recognize uh, important occasions, uh, employees who make an impact in our community, and, uh, and citizens who've made a difference. And so this month, Kernersville is joining a national recognition of National Public Safety Telecommunicator Week, which is a mouthful, but that is our dispatchers. That's our 911 Operators, And we participate with the Forsyth County 911 system. But in this building, we have a Kernersville Police Department Dispatchers Unit. And Amy uh, Clewis is the manager of that department and has been with the town in this capacity for, for a number of years, answering those uh, 911 calls. And her and her staff um, do a great job reassuring the citizens, assisting the police officers who are out on the call, and improving public safety in our community. Emergencies can happen at any time that require medical response, police response, or fire response. And the public safety dispatchers are the first line of communication with the citizens. They can monitor maps, they can monitor um, other information to help the officers that are on the ground. They're knowledgeable and highly trained. And they have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and well-being of our citizens. They exhibit compassion, understanding, and professionalism during what is admittedly a very difficult job. They're the unseen first responders, the people that are the reassuring uh, voice at the other end of the line. They've helped resolve peaceably a lot of very dangerous situations for, for people in our community. If it's suicide, domestic violence, family violence, uh, and many other very difficult 
um, and potentially life-threatening situations. So um, I'd like to recognize Amy and the other dispatchers who are here. Amy, I'll let you introduce them and uh, say a little bit about what y'all do and about this week, if you would. I stayed back here behind the microphone uh, because we're streaming the video so that everyone could hear, but I'll bring it forward, and if we speak in the mic, then it'll pick up for the, for the YouTube stream. Thank you, Mayor. Um, tonight I have uh, Jennifer Collins. She's our communications supervisor. And I have Kaylin Colley, and she is a telecommunicator three with us. Um, I just want to say how proud I am of, of our team. Um, they work really hard. Just in the last month, they've entered over 5,000 calls for service. They work hard day and night um, to keep the officer safe and the community safe. And we just appreciate this recognition. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you again for all you do. All right, so we have several public hearings on the agenda tonight. The policy for public hearings is printed on the agenda and displayed on the screen. When an agenda item is denoted as a public hearing, persons attending shall be permitted to address the Board of Aldermen regarding the item under consideration. Those speaking in favor speaking first those against speaking second. Proponents and opponents shall each be given 20 minutes of time to speak, you may choose to allow one speaker to utilize that time or choose to allocate the time amongst different speakers. In the event that either proponents or opponents have not designated a speaker or speakers to represent that view, the mayor shall divide the 20 minutes by the number of speakers wishing to address the board. After the opponents speak, the mayor will allow the proponents five minutes for rebuttal. And if they choose not to uh, exercise that option, then there will not be a counter rebuttal. Okay, so the first public hearing is rezoning. It's Alex Bachman, agent for 1128 South Main Street, LLC. Zoning docket K700A1. We'll begin with the presentation by our community development staff. Ms. Uh, Catherine Garner. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Board of Aldermen. Tonight's first case is K700.A1. Um, it is a single phase conditional rezoning. Uh, Bill Wright and Alex Bachman are the agents for 1128 South Main Street, LLC. The current zoning is highway business special and the proposed uh, zoning is highway business conditional for the parcel that's shown outlined in red on the screen. Um, this is more or less between the Walmart and the Target. Uh, the acreage is just over half an acre at 0.6 approximately. 
Um, this parcel was originally zoned as part of K523, which was the Harmon Mill Center zoning. Uh, in 2010, there was another single phase special use zoning, which was K700, uh, for a restaurant with drive through but that never came to fruition and the vested rights have expired. So they are rezoning for the same use. So it is um, also proposed to be restaurant with drive through service which is defined in the UDO as an establishment which delivers prepared food and or beverages to customers in motor vehicles, regardless of whether or not it also serves prepared food and or beverages to customers who are not in motor vehicles for consumption either on or off the premises. The site is located east of Harmon Creek Road and north of South Main Street, so you can see it um, here in the middle of the map off of both Harmon Creek Road and South Main Streets, off, accessed off of a private drive. Adjacent properties are zoned highway business special on all sides. It is one parcel and they're proposing one building approximately 1140 square feet. Uh, it would be accessed through internal points shared with the parcel to the west because Walmart and all of the out parcels there are served by a private drive off of South Main Street. The applicant does exceed the threshold maximum of impervious surface within the traditional 10-foot street yard because of their sidewalk. There's an existing sidewalk there coming down from Target and they're going to connect to that and wrap it around the side of the parcel. So the applicant has designated additional area as street yard in order to meet the ordinance requirements. This exhibit shows the additional area to be considered a street yard in order to maintain the impervious surface requirements above. And the street yard exhibit is included as part of the conditions with the rezoning. So it's essentially more area that would not be able to be developed for parking or drive aisle or anything um, of the impervious nature. The land use plan defines this area um, as for commercial uses, um, defined as commercial areas have been established to provide for high traffic commercial areas. They are located in three separate areas and limited in size to prevent them from overburdening the capacity of the roads and distracting from Kernersville's small town atmosphere. Uh, but the rezoning request is in conformance with the land use plan. Planning board and staff's recommendations were for approval, um, moved to, moving to amend the unified development ordinance of the town by rezoning the property in case K700.A1 from highway business special to highway business conditional, finding the rezoning is consistent with the town's comprehensive plan, the Kernersville development plan, and further being both reasonable and in the public interest because of the following facts. Petitioner has requested the one phase conditional zoning to develop for a restaurant with drive through service use. This will result in the development of an infill lot that would otherwise be difficult to develop and the proposal is consistent with the land use plan and is an appropriate use in the commercial use classification. Uh, planning board and staff also recommend approval of the site plan subject to the conditions presented in the staff report. This was heard at the March planning board meeting uh, with all members present voting in favor. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Does the board have any questions at this time? Mayor, I have one. Catherine, at one time, and this was, I was looking at this from the outside of this process as opposed to the inside. I know that there were some limitations on development on South Main having to do with drive-through restaurant service. McDonald's comes particularly, particularly to mind, and that took some advocacy, I understand, to get that done. What are the limitations now that have to do on South Main for drive-through restaurant services? There were some limitations on drive-throughs north of 421 because that was in the central Kernersville overlay district. And so this being at the far other end of South Main Street and especially being tucked off of the main thoroughfare, uh, we find that it's acceptable with the land use plan and would not um, go against goals that the town has established. Okay. Thank you, that helps. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Hooker, has anyone signed up to speak on this item? Is there anyone who'd like to speak in favor? This opportunity to speak in favor of this uh, proposed rezoning. Or opposed? Is there speaker cards in the back? All right, well, I'll declare the public hearing open. Is there anyone here to speak in favor? Seeing none, is there anyone here to speak in opposition? 
Seeing none, I'll declare the public hearing closed. Does the board have any questions? A motion to approve. Second. Would you like to be a little more specific in your motion to approve? Motion to approve 1A as written by staff. Would you like to amend your second? I second that motion. Okay. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Thompson, a second by Alderman Gorham. All in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Item B is also rezoning. It is uh, Todd Hamula, agent for Plaza Street Fund 255, zoning docket K. 524A2. Ms. Garner? Thank you, Madam Mayor. This case is also at the far end of South Main Street. Um, this is K524.A2. This is another single phase conditional rezoning. Todd Hamula is the agent for owner, owner being Plaza Street Fund 255 LLC. The requested zoning is highway business conditional, and the current zoning is also highway business conditional. This site is a little bit larger at just over an acre. It's right on the corner of Harmon Creek Road and South Main Street. This was also originally zoned as part of the K523 and K524 Harmon Mill Center zonings as an out parcel. Uh, there were multiple cases for that development. Um, a final development plan was approved in May of 2000 for a restaurant without drive through service, and this structure was removed around 2017. And in 2022, which is a correction from the staff report, K523.A1 was approved for a restaurant with drive through service. You may remember that was the Slim Chickens request. Um, that never came to fruition. There was even another attempt by another restaurant to uh, pick up that plan, and that did not come to fruition either. So Firestone is now looking to do a full rezoning for a new use. So the use that's proposed with this rezoning is motor vehicle repair and maintenance, which is defined in our ordinance as an establishment engaged in providing mechanical automotive maintenance and repair, such as engine repair, exhaust system replacement and transmission repair, and or providing other related services such as upholstery or glass replacement. This use includes service stations, but not does not include bodywork or painting. This definition includes all of the following uses in the following SIC groups. So the glass replacement, transmission repair, general repair, and automotive services. The site is located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Harmon Creek Road and South Main Street. Adjacent properties are zoned Highway Business Special um, on multiple sides, institutional and public across South Main Street, that's Tribe Baptist Church, and Highway Business Special on the west side of Harmon Creek Road as well. So the site plan that is proposed is one parcel with one building. The building would total just over 6,000 square feet. It's accessed through internal points shared with the parcel to the east through the Burger King lot. Um, NCDOT will not permit a driveway access on Harmon Creek or South Main Street. Um, it will be subject to the regulations of Harmon Mill Center's original zoning as well as the highway corridor overlay district standards. The street yards as shown on the site plan are already in existence with and filled with mature vegetation. One of the conditions that was previously proposed with the Slim Chickens rezoning was to allow them to retain the uh, street yard, which is not quite fully to our current ordinance, but we felt the re retention of the mature trees and the landscaping was benef more beneficial than just a few feet of street yard. Um, so this is proposing the same condition which staff has supported. The highway corridor overlay district requirements are in place on this site. So facade material requirements of 75% building material along the elevations visible from the right of way and the material requirements of the elevations not visible from the right of way are being met. So the, we've reviewed the photos um, and the renderings that have been submitted there on the right hand side of your screen um, to make sure that they meet the highway corridor overlay district requirements. Um, so they are in conformance with um, brick as their primary material. This site, not surprisingly, is also in, defined in the land use plan as commercial. So this rezoning request is in conformance with the land use plan. 
and planning board and staff's recommendations are approval of the following motion to amend the unified development ordinance of the town by rezoning the property in case k 524.82 from highway business conditional to highway business conditional the said rezoning being consistent with the town's comprehensive plan the kernersville development plan and being both reasonable and in the public interest because of the following the petitioner has requested a one-phase conditional zoning to redevelop out parcel 1a for a motor vehicle repair and maintenance use and the proposal is consistent with the land use plan and is an appropriate use in the commercial use classification. Uh, we are also recommending adoption of the site plan subject to the conditions presented in the staff report. This was also presented to planning board at their March meeting uh, with all members present voting in favor. And I can answer any questions that you have. Does the board have any questions of Ms. Garner at this time? No. Mr. Hooker, have we received any speaker cards for this case? Okay. There are speaker cards in the back of the room if anyone would like to speak on the next public hearing. Um, as for this public hearing, I'll declare the public hearing open. Is there anyone who'd like to speak in favor of the proposed rezoning? Seeing none, is there anyone who'd like to speak in opposition to the proposed rezoning? Seeing none, I'll declare the public hearing closed. Is there a further Questions, discussion, or do I have a motion? I move that we approve the K524A2 uh, staff recommendation uh, as stated in the uh, item under consideration. Okay, I have a motion by Alderman Apple. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Alderman Penix. All in favor? It's unanimous. All right, our next item is a public hearing on a text amendment. All text amendments are brought by the town manager, Kurt Swisher, agent for the town of Kernersville, for proposed zoning text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinances that we like to call the UDO, to amend it in its entirety to reorganize the document for clarity. This is zoning docket KT276, and there are extensive uh, materials associated with this case. I wanted to know if the alderman had been able to successfully download and access it and had time to read everything. Madam Mayor, the one that we're considering is the one that was identified in these attachments as draft. Yes. I believe that's what we're considering now. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Garner. Madam Mayor, our last case tonight is, is one we've been working on for quite some time. This is a reorganization of our existing Unified Development Ordinance, or our UDO. Um, I'm joined by Carrie Spencer, who has been working for us on a part-time basis and has um, been reviewing plans. She's been very busy. She's been reviewing plans and working on the UDO, which both are big tasks. Uh, but we are pleased to present this to you tonight. Um, as public hearing for the text amendment for KT276. And this would amend the Unified Development Ordinance in its entirety and as a recodification. I want to, before we really get started, I think it's important to note that we're not changing the regulations with this document. We're changing the order of the words and the order of the regulations that they come in to make it more user friendly. We've got, we started out with four goals to reorganize the document, to clarify the document, to update what needed to be updated and to create a parking lot of things that we know need to be touched and we know should be looked at, but we felt that it was more important to get the document in a better format first and then spend the time and the effort to really study what should be changed. So we're bringing to you things that are really studied and considered and vetted before they're proposed. So all of the regulations, all the rules stay the same unless they've been updated and, and we've been forced into changing them by state law. So there is some of that, but most of the regulations in terms of number of trees, number of parking spaces, all of that remains the same from the document that exists today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. We're going to swap back and forth on the presentation. So. Good 
Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the board. Very good to be here tonight with this project. It's been a, a big project. I've really enjoyed working on it with Catherine and her staff. The first order of business was to reorganize the ordinance so it's more readable. The ordinance needs to be readable to everybody from the land developer to the homeowner that wants to build a shed to the staff that needs to enforce it. So it's really, really important that an, uh, that the organization was such that it could be read. Uh, next. It currently, the ordinance currently consists of separate ordinances, a zoning ordinance, a definition ordinance, and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of the information is repeated in those, inform in those ordinances. So this reorganization makes it user-friendly and um, pulls language out of those individual places and puts them in an overall place that, that applies to all. There's no question, does this just, does this conflict of interest only uh, apply to zoning cases since that's where it was written? One of the things that's very important about reorganization is um, making it user-friendly but also reducing the chance that provisions are lost or forgotten in an ordinance when it's not organized. Language is more logic, logical now. Similar concept, concepts are grouped together. Um, logical order is definitely necessary to ensure that the terms and requirements are applied correctly and in the right place. This, I've got a few slides here that are examples of um, specific reorganizational areas. And I have done this for Catherine and her staff in um, pretty great detail so they can see exactly what was and what is and how they're related to one another. I think that will help in implementing the ordinance. This is an example of those, what I talked about, those general statements that are were in individual places but are in one article that applies to all. Administration, uh, administrative roles, responsibilities, uh, approval authority, that sort of thing was mixed throughout, sort of sprinkled in different places. And uh, that's been consolidated into an administrative section, which also, by the way, is much more in keeping with the way the statutes um, organize the regulation. I think that uh, a lot of amendments have been made through the years where um, an individual section was updated. <clears throat> this reorganization carries those changes through in a log logical order now. So an, an example is this, um, the article other development standards is, is very not uh, intuitive as to what it really means. So we've got now zoning standards separated from uh, development standards for individual uses and from development standards applicable to all uses. And that wasn't super clear either. Procedures were sprinkled around as well. It's another example of grouping the concepts together with all procedures in one place and an easy, um, easily recognizable who approves what. The next big goal of ours was to clarify the document. So the document started, we adopted it in 1993, and it was basically Winston-Salem for Scythe County's ordinance, and we've been tinkering with it ever since. So this one makes it our document. It clarifies from just a general elected body to the Town of Kernersville Board of Aldermen, so it's very specific. There were a few references to Forsyth County floating around in there. We cleaned all those up. Uh, but we wanted to make the document truly user-friendly. As Carrie mentioned, it's it's not helpful for staff if, if we don't understand what we're trying to enforce, and that's not helpful for the person who's trying to get a permit, and it's not helpful for you when you're reviewing rezonings. So it was really a purpose to make it more user-friendly and approachable for everybody. One of the things that we did was create a companion manual called the Town of Kernersville Land Development Manual, which will exist as just a 
reference document. It has all of the forms that we're going to be reviewing site plans under. It has the um, some design guidelines. It has a submittal requirement for civil construction plans. So lots of checklists, the forms, the calendars, the things that you need to use, the tools that you need to use to implement the rules that are in the UDO. As part of that, um, our, our new planners, Jordan Caudill and Liam Bowman, uh, created plat checklists and civil plan checklists, which was really helpful for their learning of the process and really getting into the weeds about what does this mean. Um, but these help guide what information we're looking for when a plan is submitted for review in our online permit portal, but it also helps someone figure out what they need, what information they even need to include. And the land development manual is already on the website, so we've highlighted where it's been added under the reference section. So the UDO is available on the website as a downloadable and searchable PDF, and the land development manual is already there right below it. One of the other things we did to clarify uh, who is doing what and whose responsibilities are such is to create a table of development review responsibilities. This is included in the UDO. So for every type of review or approval that we have, we have who writes a staff report, who makes the decision, who makes just a recommendation, where does the appeal go? So it helps people understand what is the flow beyond just how do I get the permit submitted into the queue, but if I don't like the answer I got, where do I go next? And that really clarifies uh, what staff's responsibility is and what their rights are for an appeal. So these are some other things that we've done. We've really looked under the hood at everything. Uh, we've created lists of tables for each article so that people can find what they're looking for quicker. Uh, we've established criteria for conditions. We've uh, put um, like items together so that you're not searching here, there, and yonder to find things. We've clarified the appeal process. Uh, we've grouped standards together, again, putting like items together. Uh, we've provided better cross-references. We've, we've really tried to make it a clearer document that will enable all of our customers from the seasoned uh, plan preparer to the homeowner trying to figure out, can we add a shed in the backyard? And if so, how big can it be and where can it go? Uh, to give them the opportunity to find this information. So the other exercise that this project entails entailed was to, and, and does entail, is to update the ordinances. I know you had um, updated your ordinances to comply with the state legislature 160D. This takes a bit of a deeper dive into the 160D statute and uh, makes sure that the statutory language is consistent and applied the same throughout. Uh, a, a very good example of it is um, conditional versus special, special use versus conditional zoning. And there were places where we could um, really clarify and and rid ourselves of words and terms that could get one into trouble if, th if it were, it could be misinterpreted. So that was a, um, a more careful review. And as a list here of the things that we, some of the things that we, highlights of the update. We put quotes on the term parking lot because we know that there's a lot, there had been a lot of conversations about parking lot. This is just planner humor, but uh, we know that there are things that should be changed, should be looked at, should be evaluated. Is this still applicable? Is this still appropriate? Are we doing life differently now in 2024 than we were in 1993 or whenever these regulations were even originally written? We know all of that. We have our own list of things that we've created that we would like to look at. As I mentioned when we got started, these are, these are not we're not saying that these are unimportant. We're saying that we want to get the document in a good order first, and then we want to spend the time to really deep dive into what is the best practice? What are other similar communities doing about this thing? How can we, how can we make a text amendment or a proposal to change the regulation that best fits our needs here in Kernersville, rather than trying to reorganize it and change all the rules at the same time? That's a, that's a really big lift. Um, so our goal was just to get it in a better order and then start chipping away at our parking lot items that where we've, where we've parked them for the time being um, so that we can bring you better text amendments at that time. Um, so this was heard at the March planning board meeting. 
Uh, we had the document posted online for review, and as I mentioned at our briefing meeting last week, uh, Mr. Dappen graciously gave of his time to help um, check for typos and extra periods and extra spaces. Um, so we've had a, we've had a lot of hands and a lot of eyes on this. Planning board and staff did recommend approval of the recodified unified development ordinance. Um, we have a member on planning board who is a commercial realtor, and um, he asked, uh, he sent me a text in the meeting and said, "Is can we go ahead and approve this?" I don't need to hear anymore. I'm really happy because he has complained a lot about how he doesn't he doesn't find our current document to be user friendly at all. Uh, but with all members present or with the members present, all voted in favor um, of recommending approval um, of this change. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, does the board have any questions at this time? Madam Mayor, I have one. Is it within the UDO? I noticed that there's a table that talks about that this this applies to certificates of occupancy. Does that is it within the UDO that applies to the parking requirements for downtown that we've had so much conversation about recently? Yes, all of those standards are in the UDO and are covered um, currently in terms of what needs to be done, um, and we're not proposing to modify that at this time. That's the, the parking lot humor that I referenced, that we, we know that there's conversations about it and that it needs to be looked at, but we're not proposing changes with this change to the ordinance tonight. We'd like further study on that. And I know you're looking at it, and I know that Mr. Swisher has got a, a group taking a look at that specifically, but I think that's something that I hope you will. Yeah, I assume that's among the parking lot items. <laughs> okay, thank you. I don't have a, a question, but I would just like to say thank you for the work that y'all did to pull this together. This is an outstanding job that y'all have done, and i just like to applaud you for the work that you've done to bring this into version. Thank you very much for your efforts. Thank you, sir. This is a public hearing. I'll declare the public hearing open. Is there anyone here to speak in favor? Seeing none, is there anyone here to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'll declare the public hearing closed. Does the board have further questions or discussion? Okay, do I have a motion? A motion to approve. A motion by Alderman Thompson. Second. Second by Alderman Gorham. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Thompson. Right, and so my understanding of this is the UDO would require board action to approve it, but that the other document, the staff will revise as needed. Yes, ma'am, that was our intention. So that way when we wanted to modify one of the checklists for a rezoning submittal or the application, we didn't have to clutter up your time at meetings like this. For that, we could make those decisions ourselves um, and then update the land development manual. So it's a companion document adopted by reference, but not an official ordinance that would require your action every time we wanted to tweak something. Okay, thank you. Mayor, I have one other question. Go ahead. Catherine, the forms that are in your manual mm -hmm. that you suggested or you alluded to, are those... Bill, could you speak more into your yes, microphone? Yes, I'm sorry, excuse no me. Uh, are those forms in PD, PDF format so that they are fillable? Uh, so that if someone's going to submit a submittal with a form that they can do that that would probably be our next step. We do have them in PDF separate. Right now they're in the UDO where they're very difficult to get out. But yeah. we have the separate files that when someone emails us and says, can you send me that, we can send that on to them. But making a true fillable PDF is probably the next next thing we'll tackle. I think that'd be a really good thing because there's nothing more frustrating, especially if you write like I do, there's nothing more frustrating than having to hand fill out a form. So I, I hope we can keep that in view. Thank you. Okay, is there anything further on this or further for our public hearings? All right, then we will move on to the public session. Our first item is speakers from the floor. We do have speaker cards at the back of the room if you'd like to address the board 
on an item not otherwise included on the agenda. Seeing no movement. Looks like nobody wants to pick up a speaker card and, and turn it in. So we will move on to item B, which is the 2023 annual reports and 2024 budget requests for the Salvation Army and the Kernersville Auto Museum. And we'll begin with the Salvation Army. And if you could state your name and your business address or home address for the record, please. Sure, my name is Dr. Brandon McCann. I'm the development director for the Salvation Army here. Um, and I wanted to introduce a few folks in the audience. So basically, I'm here today asking for funding requests for the board, uh, Madam Mayor, and the Board of Aldermen. Um, I'd like to introduce a few folks, though, here to support um, our efforts for the Kernersville Food Pantry. Uh, first of all, our, our core officers, which is Major David and Mike Young Lee, if you'll stand up. We have here our chairwoman, uh, Diane Harper Long, with our advisory council. We also have our president and CEO of the local chamber, Chris Comer. Uh, is anyone here from our board, our council? So, Dwayne. And then if there's any other volunteers, I think a few, one stepped out. We got one volunteer there, and we have one that stepped out, and he'll be uh, back in. And if you'll direct your attention to the PowerPoint to your right, uh, we'll go through those. So we'll go to the next slide. So our primary role here, the Kernersville Pantry, is really to combat food insecurity among the residents of Kernersville, ensuring that individuals and families have access to nutri nutritious meals. Next. It's our history. We've been around a while. We've been here since 1994, uh, started by a local church. And it became a little bit too uh, cumbersome and, and too big, so that we actually took over the pantry in 2018, and we moved into the old library in 2019. So, and that's where we serve today. Uh, we are the second largest in Forsyth County, uh, just underneath Clemens Food Pantry. Uh, we are categorized as a Tier 4 by the Second Harvest Food Bank, meaning that uh, our need is greater than uh, the usual food pantry. So we receive greater aid from the Second Harvest Food Bank from the federal government to help assist with our efforts. Next slide. Last year, we served 904 families. Since April of last year, that is over 76% growth. We typically were seeing around maybe three to 400 families a month. Uh, now we're serving as an excess over 900. Uh, just last month in March, we had 913 households, uh, which is around 2,471 people. Uh, last year, we served just over 21,000. Uh, most of what we do, um, we do have two part-time folks in, in our officers, our core officers, but most of what we do are by our volunteers. Uh, they come in three days a week or more to help uh, sort food and put those in the boxes. Uh, typically, on average, we do about 1,000 food boxes a month. Um, it comes out to average around 15,000 boxes a year. Uh, next slide. And so our food boxes uh, weigh about 40 pounds. Uh, did Nathan come back in? Um, and I wanted to show you what a food box looks, actually looks like. We brought one just to show you an example. Um, each food box weighs approximately about 40 pounds. And, you know, this is just not your average canned food or, uh, or boxes. We're actually putting fresh meat. We're putting fresh vegetables and fruit from our local grocery stores. Uh, we go out uh, at least three days a week or more picking up food from, thank you, from our local grocery stores in addition to what we get from the Second Harvest Food Bank. And nothing is left to waste. Anything at the end of the day uh, that we have left over is actually donated to the local reptile center. They actually come into the food pantry and pick up any leftovers, and those are, are fed to, uh, to the local reptiles. Next slide. So we distribute on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. I'm, I'm sure you've all seen the cars lining up between noon and one is the day at the times that we serve. Um, we on average have about nine volunteers in that hustle of busy uh, hour that we uh, provide those food boxes. Um, as I said earlier, we have two part-time employees. Uh, one uh, that's uh, main job is really to drive the, the food pantry van to pick up the, uh, the donations from our local uh, grocery stores. Next slide. 
And like I said, our, our primary food source is our six local grocery stores in Kerrsville. About a half a million dollars comes in as in-kind donations each year to the food pantry, mostly from the Second Harvest Food Bank and from those six grocery stores. So we have a, a huge uh, support here locally. Um, and like I said, we receive uh, support from the Second Harvest Food Bank through our Tier 4 status. Next slide. Um, we go through a lot of integrity at the Salvation Army. Uh, not only are we audited by TFAP, which is the federal program, but we also have an external financial audit, uh, which will pass with flying colors this year. And we also have a Salvation Army internal audit, and they come through and look at our uh, not just our books and our financials, but also how we run our operations. We are advised by a 12-member council, um, which has our chairperson, and then also we're led by our majors, our, our officers that are commissioned by the Salvation Army. All right, next slide. So who are the supporters, uh, who are the benefactors of uh, the food pantry or those that are on food stamps or anyone that is of the SNAP program, the SSI, Medicaid, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, and the NSLP program? We do provide on a case-by-case -case basis emergency assistance to those who are in great need. So an example would be someone that's lost their home uh, or other, uh, maybe a, a fire or something like that. They can come to the food pantry and, and uh, obtain assistance. Okay, next slide. And 98% of our participants uh, are, res are residents of, of Carousel. So in the end, we're asking for your consideration for $20,000 to support our, our efforts. Uh, we're in great need to uh, run and pay for our driver that runs our operations with the van, um, help with food, fuel costs, which comes out to about $3,000 a year, our insurance for that van, which is around $1,000, and maintenance as well. Um, all of that coming down to around $20,000 that we're uh, requesting your consideration. So uh, I really appreciate um, your time today and not only giving you an update on, on our efforts with the Salvation Army with, through our food pantry here in Kernersville and, and what's going on, but also your uh, attention and our need for funding to help continue our efforts to feed the homeless and feed the needy here in Kernersville. And I'll open it up to any questions. Are there any questions? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to recognize the Kernersville Auto Museum. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Taylor. I'm the curator of the Kernersville Auto Museum. I reside at 726 Bluff School Road here in Kernersville. Thank you so very much uh, for this privilege and opportunity to stand before you a few minutes this evening to give you a little update on how it's going with the Kernersville Auto Museum. It's always much easier to give a presentation when it's all positive. And I'm here to tell you, we got some great things going on at the museum. This past 12 months, calendar year 23, we had over 3,000 people to come to the museum. We've got people coming from all walks of life, from all over the world. Uh, just to name a few, France, England, Germany, Hungary, uh, last weekend on Sunday afternoon, we had a couple from New Zealand. Uh, we've got a wonderful website, and that's how they find out about us. When they come to this country, they're looking for museums, and and we we come up to the top when it when it comes to automobile museums for this area. Uh, we definitely are a tourist attraction uh, for many 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 people. Uh, just uh, last weekend, we had uh, 20 people to pop in at one time. They said they just had dinner at Cagney's, uh, and they were coming to the museum. They spent a couple hours there. 
and they came from uh, the Greensboro area. But um, we, uh, we obviously, uh, the triad area uh, or our major uh, uh, visitors come from the triad area. Uh, we get a lot of people coming from Charlotte and uh, the Raleigh area and obviously all over the United States. Every weekend, uh, we have people, it seems like every weekend, from New York City. Uh, they come here to visit relatives, and what happens? They're looking for something to do, so they bring them to the museum. When I stood before you uh, last year, uh, I think we had uh, 17 cars in our museum. Presently, we have uh, 44 vehicles in the museum. So we are very, very fortunate. Uh, we are growing. Uh, we have had this past year six automobiles uh, donated uh, to the museum. Uh, and just, in fact, in the last 90 days, we've had three uh, classic vintage vehicles donated. And all three of them are very, very rare um, automobiles. I might take just a moment to tell you about the three. Uh, one of them is a 1951 Allstate. And I bet many of you here in this room have never heard of an Allstate. It's the catalog store vehicle. It was sold by Sears and Roebuck. Uh, I'd never seen one until this one came to us. Uh, this is a very unique little car, and it's getting a lot of attention. Uh, we've got a 1940 Bantam. The Bantam is where the... United States military jeep came from. The people who built the little Bantam heard that the military was looking for something to replace the horses out on the battlefield, so they came up with this little car. Uh, and they took the platform and the running gear from this little car that I have in the museum and made this jeep from it. Um, and the military tried it out, and they said it's exactly what we need. We need hundreds of thousands of them. And this was a tiny little company in Butler, Pennsylvania, and they just threw up their hands and said, we can't do that. So they said, can we get Ford and Willis involved and give them the specifications? And they agreed to do that. So uh, I think Bantam built about 3,000 Jeeps. Uh, I have a friend out in Marshall who has one. Looks just like the Ford and the Willis Jeep. But uh, we're very fortunate to have it there, and, and it's, it's getting a lot of, uh, a lot of nice, nice reviews. And last but not least, we, we just got from uh, Paradise Valley, Arizona, uh, a 1951 Crosley station wagon. Um, that may not mean much to you, but it means a lot to me. It was the first company car that Piedmont Aviation and Piedmont Airlines owned. I'm getting the stickers put on the window, on the doors now that says PA is our original logo they will go on that car, and it'll sit over in the corner where all the other Piedmont memorabilia is sitting. So I'm pretty excited personally about that one. But uh, anyhow, I, uh, we're very fortunate to have those cars uh, donated to us. I called this gentleman about that particular car, uh, and he said, well, you know, I've been thinking about just donating this car to a museum. And I said, well, you, you're talking to the right person. <laughs> so anyhow, it, it came to fruition. Um, we, uh, we never want to lose sight of our vision for the museum, uh, and that is to preserve the history uh, of these vintage and uh, classic antique automobiles for the general public to view and, and to educate our young people and inspire them uh, about the history of these cars and, and how 
uh, how these vehicles uh, have developed our nation. Uh, and there's so much history behind those. But, uh, and uh, coupled with that, our senior citizens, I, I can't say enough about them. Uh, they love coming there. Uh, last uh, three weeks ago, we had three vans in the parking lot on Saturday morning, all at one time, from seniors who were uh, coming from the nursing homes in the area. And uh, they just love it. And uh, almost everyone has a story to tell about a car that they either owned or their parents owned. Um, and you have to take the time to listen, and, and they're very interesting. I have to tell you this one story. This lady uh, was celebrating her 90th birthday, and she came up to me and she said, this just beats all I've ever seen in my life. How in this world did this come about? And I said, well, you see, there was an old man that lived in this community who owned a bunch of old cars, and he wanted to put a smile on the faces of a lot of old people. <laughs> and she said, well, that sure was nice of him. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, it is going extremely well, uh, better than I was ever expected it to be. Uh, the first uh, 90 days of this year, we've had over 1,200 visitors. So I'm projecting over 4,000 for the calendar year of 2024. We're very fortunate. Uh, we, As you know, we have a very uh, extremely viable auto club here in Connorsville, the Old Salem Club. We have uh, volunteers from that club who just can't wait to get there uh, to serve their time. Uh, they love it. Uh, 100 percent of our our uh, people are volunteers. There's no paid salaries uh, in the museum, and uh, we continue to have a five star rating from the review from our reviews, uh, uh, which we are quite quite pleased with that. Um, additionally, I am extremely uh, pleased with the collaboration that we have between the Folly and the Gardens. Uh, we have their rack cards, they have our rack cards. Uh, we have a link to their sites and they have links to our sites. So uh, it's uh, almost weekly we have people coming in, they'll have one of our rack cards and they say, well, we picked this up at the Gardens or the Folly and vice versa. So we're working very closely together, and I think that's a really, really good thing. Uh, again, thank you uh, for this opportunity to give you an update on the museum. I hope you are as pleased as I am as the way it's going, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have at this time. Mayor, I don't have a question. I do have a comment. My family uses a an online website when we're anywhere. If we're looking for, you know, a currently popular restaurant and place that we may have been to many times before, uh, places to stay, so forth, it's called TripAdvisor. And you're probably aware, I'm sure you are, Jim, that... Uh, I think it was two weeks ago I clicked on the TripAdvisor, Kernersville, and I ended up at one of the tabs that said the the three most frequently visited tourist attractions in Kernersville. I think the first one was the Carolina Field of Honor. Mm -hmm. I think the second one may have been the Folly, but much to my delight, the third one was the Kernersville Auto Museum. And that is from a you know, totally voluntary input from people who see and admire the museum. And I think that's just a tremendous accomplishment given the the uh, youth of your enterprise here. And I, mm -hmm. I really uh, am very proud of what you've been able to accomplish. Well, thank you very much for those comments. I really appreciate that. And again, thank you so kindly for your support. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
Jim, we appreciate all you've done for that, uh, the idea of creating that, and uh, congratulations on the success of the Automobile Museum. I enjoy going to it as well. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Diane Harper Long for your tireless work for, on behalf of the Salvation Army, the majors who joined us today. Thank you for your efforts, the board and volunteers. Um, we really appreciate all you do for the people in the community. Thank you for your involvement in these uh, nonprofit organizations. All right, is there anything more on the um, reports and budget quests at this time, Mr. Swisher? All right, we will move on then to item C, which is a resolution authorizing the filing of an application for a fire prevention and safety grant through FEMA. Madam Mayor, board, you have in your packet the memo from uh, Fire Rescue Chief Alderman uh, to myself and Franz Ader about the grant. As the mayor mentioned, it is a fire prevention and safety grant offered through FEMA. Uh, the amount of the grant is $15,000 uh, to go toward the purchase of a fire extinguisher training system, and we only have a 5% cost match on that. So if we are awarded the grant, uh, we'll only have to cover $750 of the 15000 So we're asking uh, for approval from the board to apply for that grant. Are there further questions, or do I have a motion for approval? I move approval. approval. Got a motion by um, Alderman Pennock, second by Alderman Barrow. All in favor? It's unanimous. All right, item D, consideration of an ordinance for budget amendment seven. This is probably the shortest budget amendment we've ever had. There is only one, one item in it. It is to move the million dollars that the board approved last week. Uh, for the construction of the turning lanes on Shields Road. The reason it's a million and not the 818 is because we borrowed a million dollars and we are responsible for any cost overruns. So we're gonna move the full million. Of course, if we don't use the full million, uh, it'll revert back to the general fund. Okay, do I have a motion for approval? Got a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Thompson, second? Second. Second, Alderman Gorham, all in favor? It's unanimous. All right, Mr. Swisher, your report. I'll be brief. I have nothing. Okay. Mr. Powell. I'll also be brief. I don't have a report tonight. All right. Thank you. Matters to be presented by the mayor and board of aldermen. I'll start with Alderman Penix. Uh, I'll be brief also, mayor. Thank you. Alderman Gorham. No comment. Alderman Apple. Well, even more brief. No, ma'am. Alderman Barrow. The only thing I have is I would like to make sure everybody has on their mind the uh, Kernersville Pool, Ernie and uh, Kurt is working on that thing. We really appreciate it, and we're going to work this year on coming up with the money to pay for it. That's all I have. Ernie, could you come forward a minute? Could you tell us a little update about the survey and how to access it and so, the number of responses we still need to get before it's completed? We need to hit about 1,200 surveys to trigger a statistically valid needs assessment. We are sitting around 550 right now. Okay. So um, you can go through links on our Facebook page, on our website. There's the uh, pond master site for for engagement um i was going to do the big wheel big deal event to bring people in but when the kiwanis club moved their uh, event over i lost a lot of my vendors so instead of doing the big wheel big deal on the 20th i'm going to be at the touch the truck with pond to do surveys and with big wheels to just free play free ride to try and get as much engagement as possible to get to, to hit that number um, and I'm still pushing it out through um, newspaper, Facebook, socials, and all that type of, type of things to, to get people engaged to, to hit that number. So it wasn't immediately apparent to me how to get to the survey. So could you okay. walk us through, like, how to get to it? Yeah. Because I haven't filled it out yet. Okay. So um, if you go to our website, there's a link to the, to the pond site. On that site, we'll have all the updates on... Um, 
uh, the events, the survey itself, um, and the process itself, and it'll give updates. Um, I don't I don't have the the link off the top of my head, but it's um, if you just go to our website, you can go to it. See, I looked and I didn't see it. Is it? Yeah, Adam, can you or Catherine, can you pull up T O K Kville Parks right? Dot com. Yeah, T, it's kvparks.com. Okay. So I went through the upcoming events and looked at latest news, okay. and I wasn't sure where to find this. Okay. Okay. I'll make sure it gets up there. If it's not up there right away, it should, it should be up there. Thanks. Madam Mayor, I'm not the brightest bulb in the box, but there may be folks like myself that aren't really sure the nature of the survey that, you, that we're alluding to here. Could you explain that, please? Frank? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I wasn't hey, um, looking. I'll, I'll um, summarize it for a minute. Okay. Right. So um, Mr. Apple inquired if you could tell us a little more about this survey. Okay, so the survey itself was it asks 25 questions, and the questions range from what are your favorite parks, what are your favorite activities right now, um, what do you think about the status of the parks, cleanliness, uh, maintenance, so on and so forth. And then we go into the next set of questions, we'll go into um, what would you like to see the parks offer? Uh, where do you feel that we have amenities that amenity needs that we don't currently offer right now, like a pool or a splash pad, uh, walking paths? And then I'll ask, um, uh, what other activities would you like to see in terms of the services that we offer, programming and so, so on and so forth? And then it, it, that the whole 25 questions is based on what do you like to do now, what would you like to see coming in the, in the next 10 years? And it kind of helps us gauge the facilities in terms of ranks and needs and wants. So that way we can, when we build out the park system for the next 10 years, we have a good gauge on where we should be focused our efforts on. Uh, and then we also do that again when we go more specifically to a specific park. For like, say, for instance, Civitan. We did it in 2012. It gave us data points for a certain set of, thing, of items. For that one, it told us that we have to focus our efforts on Civitan and bring it up to a current, our current state of, of uh, upgrades, right? So when we went to Civitan, we did specifically, what do you want to see in this park? And that's where we got the data points of what, how we created that site plan. So that's kind of gives us the, the background. So uh, for this one, if we come out and say, okay, our park system right now is pretty much upgraded when you look across the board, you know, then we're asking, where else would you want to see parks? Or do you feel the parks are, are walkable or close to you where you live compared to where, you know, your houses are? And it gives us an idea of where we need to look moving forward for land to put neighborhood parks. Are they walkable? Can you get to the park? You know, all that kind of stuff is where this information is important to give us an idea of do the current citizens feel they're, they can get to a park fine or do we have to look at putting parks more spread out to the far reaches of where our jurisdiction has grown, so on and so forth. So that's where we get all that information from. So I would like to also, you know, it's really relying on, uh, you, you got to have a lot of steps right now to get to the survey. Right. And we looked right now it's hard to get together to. and couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to have under news on the face place, on the face front page of our website, right. there's a, icon for news and I'd like to change the photo to something relating to the park. Okay. I'm sure you've got a great photo. Mm -hmm. And instead of saying there are no new posts currently, put the, website. the survey, right. a link to the survey there and then news archive can be below it because when you, even when you click news archive, there's other information about other departments, but nothing about... Are we talking about the, the TOK page or the KB yes. page? Yes. Okay. And I'd like to have it apparent on the Parks and Rec page, because if you had people signing up for youth sports and that sort of thing, then they could see it. Because, you know, that going through fine. the ban... And, and if it's in that banner area, that's fine. But you, as you scroll through, if it was there, it's dropped off. Right. Okay. Um, so I think that would help, because then it would be easier to share, you know, that it's available. Right. I'll get I'll get Vicky to put that up there 
But I think that's a really good idea to go to touch a truck because uh, right. there could be 4,000 people there. Right. On that note, though, when you get um, like a big community lo- event like that or something on Facebook, you know, the some of the things that we've gotten as uh, surveys about development and that sort of thing that people sign these petitions, you know, they may not even live in the state of North Carolina. They mm-hmm. may not live in Kernersville. They may live in the Kernersville area, but not. Right. How do we sort out... We have uh, on that survey. Responding. Okay. Right, on that survey, there is a uh, questions of: Are you a city resident? And which quadrant do you represent? So it's got a map of Kernersville where they can click the quadrant they're at, and if you know, they'll give us: Yes, I'm a resident with your zip code, and it's double coming in kind of ways to give us an idea of what the residents are giving us in terms of input. Okay. Yeah. So we've got some qualifying questions. Plus, also, we did the quadrant map so that we can figure out where the... Are we lacking in a certain area of Kernersville that we're not getting input from? Anyway, so that's kind of a part of that survey, too. Okay. Do board members have any other ideas about how to get this the word out? I, I will say I did find the survey on Ernie's page. Okay. But it's way down the line. It's under news, under play onward. So is that what it is? Okay. Yeah, you got to roll back to November the 3rd. So I agree under with the mayor. View, under View All News? Under News, click on, on Ernie's website, kvparks.com, under News, and then under Play Onward, and then it has a link to the survey. Right. Okay. So, I mean, you got to take some steps. It needs to be for far. Okay. It needs to be just kind of an icon by itself on the town's front page and on Ernie's front page. When I looked at that, I didn't click through all that, and I thought that was just an announcement that we were starting the master plan. Yeah. So, I mean, you got to really, it's too hard to find if you want somebody to fill it out, really. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get Vicki to bring it up to the forefront. Yeah, I just have a link on the front of your page, and Adam can put one on the front of the town's page. Cool. Where it's easier to see. Okay, thank you for addressing that. Anything else? Thank you. All right. All right, Chris. Or, John, did you have more? Okay, Chris. I have nothing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Kerners Folly on their uh, grand opening of their visitor center. And I would note that um, Jim has already left, but uh, he had brought a vehicle over for that uh, community day at the Folly. And he also had offered a vehicle. It got rained out, of course, the um, Kiwanis Touch a Truck Day in March got rained out and it's been shifted, as Ernie mentioned, to April 20th. But he had offered uh, a vehicle for families to sit in and take photographs uh, at the uh, Kiwanis tr- Touch a Truck Day. So the uh, automobiles and the automobile museum, we see them in parades. They're there at the museum, but they're also at other community events. So we appreciate that involvement in the community. All right. Is there, is there anything further before the board this evening? Motion right. to adjourn. Got a motion to adjourn by Mayor Pro Tem Thompson. Second. Second by Alderman Gorham. All in favor? It's unanimous. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>